It's a real pleasure to be back. Uh, I've got to say, I'm quite jealous that you all have this nice new building. We didn't have that when I was here. Um, it's also nice to see some familiar faces. And one thing that I always like is knowing that there are very smart people that continue to work on this stuff. And that's a bit about what I'm going to be talking about here. Uh, EPRI, EPRI is the Electric Power Research Institute. It's a nonprofit R&D firm that does a lot of research on behalf of the electric utilities in the United States, some international engagement as well. And over the last 18 months or so, I've served as the innovation scout for photovoltaics. And that has seen me travel a lot of different places and connect with a lot of different people to see what is going on in the world of PV, both from a market standpoint, from a technology standpoint, from a participant standpoint, business model standpoint and price standpoint, all of which are directly influenced by the technology. And so today I'm going to talk about sort of the current state of play for photovoltaics and how I see things happening going forward. And I'll be happy to take questions. And if you have comments or you have questions, please feel free to ask. Um, if you've got a burning question, go ahead and raise your hand. I'll be happy to address it straight away. Otherwise, I'll take questions at the end. Uh, the main key takeaways that I'm going to go over today, uh, the first one being that the incumbent technology, crystal and silicon, is going to continue to dominate the market going forward. This is due in part through the economies of scale that we see in terms of the manufacturing capacity and also the price reductions that that has resulted in and the overall market share and the incremental improvements from an efficiency standpoint that continue to happen and also the durability and the fact that banks and other lenders are very comfortable with this technology and therefore they're willing to lend against it. That's an important thing to consider for project development going forward. Second key takeaway, power electronics are ultimately going to influence how photovoltaics get deployed and they're going to become smaller and more elegant and more module integrated. Um, and they'll have higher functionality, such that PV systems in the future won't just be about exporting electricity back into the grid, but it'll be about actually supporting the grid and providing uh, grid stability and voltage regulation. And lastly, um, improvements across the value chain are going to continue to see a cost reduction in system prices and therefore lower levelized costs of electricity from photovoltaics. And what that means is that PV as a whole is going to become more cost competitive against other forms of generation, which is ultimately a good thing, which you all want considering your future paths. So this is the historic and current PV industry pricing. And it's almost like this line has a story attached to it. Um, you can see the, the bump in the center there. It goes up to 350 and 325. That's where you had the silicon shortage. Um, and then you can see the dramatic cost reduction over the last two, three years. Uh, part of that is due to the fact that you have lots of scaling up from a manufacturing standpoint. Uh, the efficiencies have improved, but that's predominantly the, the cost reductions that you're seeing is predominantly the improvement in manufacturing, the economies of scale that's been seen where you have manufacturing shifting to Asia and these companies that are able to get cheap financing for their manufacturing facilities in order to take advantage of some of the feed and tariffs and other subsidies in other markets. And that has its own trials and tribulations. Somebody today at the Clean Energy Week referred to it as the solar coaster. Um, I don't know if that's an accurate term, but it's quite interesting. The main cost drivers associated with these prices are the efficiency improvements, the economies of scale with respect to manufacturing, the supply and demand imbalance, such that when you have all of this manufacturing capacity and you don't have the demand, or if you have the demand and then it suddenly goes away because you have one of those subsidies fall out, there is more PV on the market than you can sell. And folks have to reduce their prices. And then arguably there's subsidized manufacturing. And depending on who you listen to, some people say that's a bigger issue than others. Um, but I should say that right now, you can get modules at roughly 70 cents on the dollar. 
Going forward, this is the global PV market forecast, and you can see three different lines moving forward from right now. Um, you've got a green, red, and blue line. Choop, right there. Uh, and you can see that this is on a cumulative basis worldwide. Last year, we had roughly 23.6 gigawatts of capacity that was installed. Okay. Um, these numbers come from Paul Mintz. I think of Paula Mintz as being one of the most conservative analysts in the industry. She's very cautious about putting forward numbers, and so in many cases they could be bigger than this. But for this year, she's predicting that we're probably going to be closer to the accelerated forecast again, so somewhere around 30 gigawatts of installed capacity on a worldwide basis. Um, which has some people worried that there's a consolidation coming in the future. Uh, you see the margins being squeezed on these manufacturers, and if they go out of business, then that doesn't help. However, you have other markets like China that just doubled down on their renewable energy targets, and they've increased the overall capacity that they want to install from a photovoltaic standpoint. So, uh, depending on how rosy your outlook is, PV is generally going to continue to go up. This is module production by technology type and by region last year. And you can see that the predominant technology is still crystalline silicon. Um, it's interesting that we're seeing thin film actually decrease in size with respect to market share. Part of that has to do with the closures and bankruptcies of the various startups in Silicon Valley. Um, hopefully that's not going to take care of all of them uh, because in the long term, thin film still shows promise. Uh, but you also see that by region, tremendous amount of the production is actually in Asia. You know, predominantly in China, you've got the rest of Asia, and then Japan. If you sum all three of those, it's more than 85% of the overall capacity worldwide. Production costs are coming down purely on a tier one crystalline silicon module basis. And so you can see that as these costs come down, the PV technology becomes a more uh, exciting choice for the folks that are installing it or deciding between this technology and another type of technology. So coming from the electric utility standpoint, their goal is to try and keep the lights on as reliably and as cheaply and as cleanly as possible. Uh, they're very susceptible to price rises. And so as the price comes down, that's a good thing. And this will translate into greater install capacity going forward. But this also means that the thin films will have to improve their efficiency or increase their manufacturing capacity to reach economies of scale that they don't currently have in order to be able to compete with these guys. Um, an interesting trend in the market is trend towards thinner wafers. And you can see on the top right that you've got the diamond wire sawing instead of the traditional wire sawing. And then this is my favorite image, this uh, ion cannon. It's an example of what folks like Twin Creeks Technology are doing. Um, what they're using is this this bicycle wheel right here spins around, and you can see that each of these little things right here is actually where you, lay, you load a silicon wafer, or sort of the feedstock. And then this bicycle wheel will spin around with this bank vault door closed, and then you've got a, a, plasma, or you've got a proton beam in the center of this gigantic monstrosity that fires into the center. They've got a, a magnet that cleans up the beam. Those protons get implanted evenly because this is spinning across all of those wafers. And depending on the strength of that proton beam, those protons get implanted in the actual silicon feedstock. And when that happens, they get heated up. You get this gas that takes place, and the gas actually cleaves off the wafer. And so right now, they're actually trying to increase the thickness of their wafer. Um, so they're generating wafers that are roughly 20 nanometers thick. Um, did I get that right? 20 microns? Um, I, 
don't quote me on my metrics, but uh, thinner than what we've got now. And they're trying to get to 25 because that's where uh, ultimately the, the energy that goes into producing the wafers is most beneficial to what you get out. Um, one of the problems that they're having right now is with throughput because one of these machines right here can only produce about six or eight megawatts worth of cell capacity on an annual basis. You're talking roughly 160 wafers an hour. And to feed a full-on manufacturing line, you'd need a lot of these things, which is good if you're Twin Creeks. Um, but ultimately, the goal is to reduce the curve losses and reduce your silicon costs to reduce the cost of your technology. And this is what you can do with it when you end up with one of these really thin wafers. You can, it becomes flexible. Uh, going forward, we'll see specific products developed for niche markets. So you have, you know, CIGS type technology that's flexible, uh, roll to roll in some cases. And this is being developed for different rooftops that may not be able to support the, the actual weight associated with the traditional crystalline silicon system. Um, you also have companies like 10K Solar that have this sawtooth design and on one side you have a traditional um, crystalline silicon based module and on the other you've got a reflector and when you combine the two in this unique balance of systems you can reduce your your balance of systems cost because you can reduce your wind loading. Um, and this reflector actually adds, it takes a 180 watt rated panel up to 260 or just there above. And the added cost of that relative to the added power that you get is not high enough to bring the cost of the system up. And so it's a novel way to deploy more solar at lower cost. Um, going to the power electronics, seeing a transition from you know, the traditional module to AC modules. Obviously, these will have various applications. You're not going to use this on a utility scale project, but on a rooftop residential or a small scale commercial project where you might have partial shading for elements of the system, this is a way to get more power out of your system. At the same time, you're seeing a transition from the power electronics that are standalone that you wire into the module to something that looks like this to something that looks like this. And that's the more elegant solution. It's also a way for installers and project developers to have one point of contact if there happens to be a warranty issue. And so thinking about this from a business context, when you develop a project, you want to go to one person that is going to fix things if things are a problem. And if you've got a situation like this, you could end up with two or three different points of contact for your warranties. And so uh, having it integrated into the module is a good thing. And it can also reduce your installation costs because you just simply plug them together. Uh, this is pretty cool. The onset of the smart inverter. This is where you have your inverter enable your PV system to do more than just export electricity. This is where you have grid stability and grid support. Um, providing VAR support and power curtailment. Uh, and this is what the electric utilities will really like to see, particularly as you have higher and higher penetration rates of distributed PV. Um, and if there ever is a trend to sort of redo the way the electric utility rates are structured such that um, the rates are broken out into a transmission and distribution and network access and generation component. And they make the argument that the PV on your roof is only the generation component from a net metering standpoint. The PV system operators can then say, well, hang on, you need to give us credit where credit is due and we can provide ancillary services, which we should also gain some economic benefit from. Um, this is more of a business model issue, and we're seeing distributed PV ownership really take off, particularly in the US. We have net metering, which is essentially one for one. If you generate a kilowatt hour on your rooftop and you use a kilowatt hour, it's an equal trade. 
uh, and that goes back to the comment that I made just a second ago about the regulatory rates. At the moment, they're not broken up, and so it's a really good deal. And so what is happening is you have companies like Solar City and Sunrun and Sungevity that will come up to you and offer you rooftop PV for free. And they'll say, all right, all you have to do is sign here, and you'll buy the power for the next 15 or 20 years. And oh, by the way, it'll be cheaper than what you pay your current utility bill. So it's a really a win-win for you and that company. Um, the only downside is the utility just lost uh, a solid chunk of their revenue because those kilowatt hours aren't coming back. They're being offset by the PV system that's gone up on the roof. Um, but massive uptake in this in California. And as the cost of the systems come down, and as the uh, efficiency of the installers gets better, we'll see a, a transition where distributed PV sort of makes its way across markets that don't have the same level of insulation or irradiance that California does. Um, these are just a list of performance improvements for conventional PV. And to be honest, you are probably more familiar with these than I am. Um, but things like copper metallization in lieu of silver, from a purely commodity basis, the cost of silver is going up. So we're looking for ways that we can reduce those costs. Um, Gen 110 is another interesting startup company. They're actively looking at utility um, customers to try and identify the utility customers that spend the most on their electricity to cherry pick the homes that would most benefit financially from a solar uh, installation on their rooftop. And then you have the third party leasing model and the comment that I make towards the bottom is that the breakthrough technologies do exist, but the likelihood that we'll see any of those outside of the lab before 2020 is probably pretty slim. Um, there was a paper done recently in Austin at the IEEE conference on gallium arsenide. Uh, Alta devices, I hope it works. But right now, even if one of those cool new technologies comes out of the lab and actually transitions through to commercialization, it takes several years and several installations before the financial community is actually willing to provide dollars for those projects because they have to get comfortable with using that technology as well. And so they want to see demonstration projects. They want to see the technology out on sun for time. Lastly, uh, a couple examples of some novel PV technology. Um, so this is Solaria. They're another Bay Area startup. And if you look at them dead on, like this top left image, it looks like a traditional module. Um, but ultimately, if you look at this one, it looks like there's soiling that's taking place. W what's happening is that they have actually taken a conventional crystalline silicon module or crystalline silicon cell, diced it up, as you can see here, and split it up, and then they've put it over sort of a, they put a, a hemispheric glass over the top of it. And so you end up with low concentration PV. And you can take um, a module about the same size as a conventional module and get 260, 280 watts production um, using two and a half times less silicon. And they actually can I think reduce, th there's some other cost savings that they have because of the rigidity of this um, wave-like glass. And so it actually helps with their wind loading and things like that. The problem is because of this low concentration, you actually require direct insulation. And so you have to put it on a tracker. Uh, but this soiling that you see down here is depending on how you're looking at it. If you're dead on and you're looking at it straight away, then you see the blue part like this. But if you're off to the side, then you're seeing the back sheet. And that's exactly the same way that the, the sun has to be tracked, because otherwise the light will hit the back sheet rather than the cell. Um, this is third generation PV. This is Solar Junction. Uh, they have a technology roadmap in existence today using no new um, materials that will take them to 50% efficiency over the next few years. And you can see a, an actual cell that they have here. 
that is 43.5% efficient. And this is using all kinds of crazy layers. Um, this would be used in high concentration PV. You'd put it under a Fresnel lens and you put it on a tracker or you'd set it up into space. But uh, when you show conservative utility guys that have been hearing that PV's coming, PV's coming, PV's coming for the last 30 years, and you suddenly demonstrate that you have a cell that's over 40% efficient, suddenly they say, whoa. Um, and so key takeaways again, uh, just reiterating what I've said, the industry growth is going to be substantiated around the conventional photovoltaics, crystalline silicon, PV, um, and that's due to economies of scale seen in the manufacturing and also the incremental improvements in the efficiency gains. Uh, the power electronics are going to play a big part going forward, both in terms of module integration and grid integration and grid support, especially when you have higher and higher penetration rates of distributed PV. And lastly, as all of these improvements continue to take place, the cost of the systems are going to continue to come down. And I say the cost of the systems because the actual module technology is representative of a, of a minority stake in the overall system cost in many cases now. So the balance of systems or the power electronics or the permitting and the soft costs are what need to come down in many different markets. Uh, but as those system prices come down, you'll see higher and higher penetration rates of PV and greater and greater uptake. Um, and that's just about the extent of things. I've got one more slide that I just want to show you, and that is this one right here. And you can see from the German utility grid, or the German national grid actually, that PV can really play a substantial role in uh, one country or many countries' electricity use. Um, at one point during the same day, I think PV got up to 50% of the overall utility grid, but coming from one of our technical guys at EPRI, this, this quote right here, there's no current technical limitation for increased penetration of PV on the grid, but it's something that we've got to be careful with and we've got to watch. So thank you very much. And I appreciate your time. Yeah. We do have one. Um, in your slide number 12, you uh, mentioned that there is something on uh, the next slide. Yeah, um, cheap time of cell architecture based on crystal and silicon cell foundation. Um, so is this already something on the market, or is that one of those? Uh, that came after a brief conversation that I had with somebody that's sitting in the front row of this uh, organization right now. Um, I, that's based on if, if um, the research associated with growing germanium on a silicon wafer could lead to something else, that would be leveraging the existing cell architecture to um, create something that could, could reach higher and higher efficiencies. Uh, and I think that if there's a way to build upon all of the work that's been done already, rather than just completely creating a, a new technology like CADTEL or CIGS or, or CZTS, all of which have their own promises, but if there's a way to leverage the existing work that's been done on crystalline silicon, that would be a great way for the industry really to, to continue up the chain. Yeah. Yep. Um, I was interested in the, the comment about the inverters on the, on the modules, the module integrators. I, you said that that would lead to improved economics. And that seems counterintuitive to me, because I thought at the moment, the bigger the system, the, the more economic it is because you have a big and one big inverter for more modules. So I would have thought it'd be more expensive to have a whole lot of little inverters. You're right. And so these things we'll see, uh, they won't be deployed on a utility scale, but they will be deployed in smaller systems that are more customized and are more likely to see shading. Um, so on a, on a 
residential rooftop or a commercial system that's under, say, 50 kilowatts, maybe you could probably go up a little higher than that, but not by much. Um, it, it will represent a component of the market, but not the entire market. Because if you were to use this type of solution on a utility scale project, you'd actually have, you, you wouldn't be maximizing your efficiency and you wouldn't be maximizing your cost efficiency either. Yeah, I wasn't referring to utility scales. I was thinking even with, even with the rooftop ones, I know that it's generally more cost effective to get a, but I, It de really depends good. on the system. And I if you can reduce your, if you can reduce your installation cost by just allowing the guys to connect it up, I mean, essentially making the system smarter but the connections dumber so that the guys don't have to worry about where the wires go. That's, that's some way that they can make it work. Now they got two. Matthias? That's a good question. Um, it, more than likely, you probably would. And so that's where the warranty comes in. Um, and the warranty is a big deal. Uh, because we talk about the technology, but if you want to get a project built, you actually have to be able to get it financed. And the bank lenders are getting more and more stringent in whether or not they're willing to lend dollars to a project. And they want to know that the technology is robust enough to continue to go. So if, if there's a likelihood that the inverter will fail, um, particularly one of these microinverters, then you'll see the uptake in that particular inverter a lot slower than some of the other guys. So it's a valid concern. The um, lifetime of the module you're expecting, 25 years, is the same as you're expecting the inverters to last 25 years too? You know, uh, <laughs> I think that some people will make claims, but the likelihood of that happening I, remains to be seen. And it's interesting because the durability issue is a question that's come up in a number of conversations that I've had with a, a number of different stakeholders representing different positions in the industry. A uh, 25 year lifetime for PV panels, is it really necessary? Is it, or is that more of an artifact of how it started? Um, that's, that remains to be seen. I mean, because it used to be that it took that long to recover your costs. Now, depending on the market that you're operating in, you might be able to recover the cost of the system in a lot sooner than that. So could we see a PV module come on the market with a 10-year warranty in the future that comes at a lower cost? Um, maybe. Actually, adding to this discussion, the microinverters actually are rated or they're guaranteed for 20 years, which you cannot do without a large inverter. Mm -hmm. The reason why inverters die before anything else is because of the capacitors, which are not a problem here because of the new technology that they have. Mm. So it is likely that they can actually uh, uh, guarantee a, a, a module like this for 20 years because the inverter is already uh, living or supposed to live that long. Perfect. Thank you. So, well, I just had a comment on this, uh, or two comments on this, uh, um, and um, a question. Um, I, I saw yesterday for the first time a three phase inverter on yeah. the module for yeah. Canadian solar, which is very interesting. So, obviously, aiming at bigger systems. Um, or, in fact, domestic systems with loads and cool pumps and things, they have three phase power, so, um, which I didn't know about. Okay. But, um, um, these are really interesting because they get rid of DC wiring and so they avoid a safety problem of DC arcs that are hard to, just, to mm. extinguish. So, yeah. it's probably worth some value, I guess. The, the question I had was about the mounting systems, and you showed that very interesting one with the reflectors on the back. Um, so, so how much how much innovation is going on in that for mounting on different sort of roofs? Because this, I mean, this is a big part of the cost of installations. Uh, you know, to be totally honest, I, I don't... You see... There's a, a... Dow has come out with a solar shingle. Uh, that you can sort of just build into your roof. Um, I question the efficiency of that. And w when I was asking 
their sales guy, man, he was dodgy. He, he would not answer that question. He was like, no, no, that's not my product. That's, you know, I'm not competing in that market. I'm, I'm providing a rooftop. Um, <laughs> the, the, I, I think that there's tremendous scale for innovation in the balance of systems because the vast majority of the guys that are working on the balance of systems tend to be the rooftop installers. And um, th they, um, they don't have the, the long-term engineering degrees that you all do. Um, they're more practical in what they're trying to do. They're very cost-focused. But I think that there's plenty of room to innovate in terms of the um, balance of systems. You see Canadian Solar, I think, actually has a, a mounting bracket built into their module. Um, and other companies like SunPower are trying to come up, SunPower and I think Trina are also coming up with ways that you can sort of just plug the module into a particular mount. But anything that will reduce the cost of the balance of systems will really help with the overall system cost. And there are actually grants available through the Department of Energy in the US as part of the SunShot initiative to reduce these balance of system costs. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Absolutely. There's an entire research program looking at energy storage options. Um, the reason I haven't mentioned it is uh, at the moment the costs are still too high to make it economical. Um, if you're looking at energy storage, your, your better options are with thermal storage. And CSP hasn't panned out commercially yet, not to say that it won't, but it's still a work in progress. Um, going forward, uh, the what could be what could be representative of the the least cost storage would be your electric vehicle because if you plug in your vehicle and you're allowed to discharge your vehicle at certain times of day because you're not going to be driving it such that your your vehicle can act as a battery for your PV system and for the grid then that would be a way to to leverage an existing asset in a new way. Um, now, storage is really the holy grail. If you can combine storage with PV and with wind, then you eliminate or seriously mitigate the variability, um, which is really the bane of the network operators. So storage is, is and will be awesome, but it's just not here yet from a cost standpoint. And, and uh, I can't stress that enough. When I graduated from UNSW, I was like, all right, cool, we're just going to put solar everywhere and we'll save the world. All of these environmental problems solved. Uh, and then I quickly realized that it only goes on if it makes financial sense for somebody. And that's what all of these efficiencies and cost reductions get to in that if you reduce the system cost, it becomes more competitive against other types of generation, which in turn makes it easier to deploy. It makes it easier for the utility guys to say, okay, cool, I'll use solar instead of you know, building this new gigantic coal facility. I mean, there are lots of other things that play into that type of decision. Um, policies, legislation, environmental controls, um, and future forecasting. But looking at the forecasts associated with solar and the costs that are going to continue to come down, it's becoming a increasingly good option. Concentrating PV has potential. Um, I think it goes back to the comment that I made that lenders have to get comfortable with the actual technology. 
and, uh, and lenders use a third party engineer to decide whether or not they're willing to give a project dollars. And um, <laughs> the, the way that third party engineers are evaluating technology at the moment is more so based on the solvency of the company than it is the technology's attributes. And so as these companies continue to go through uh, financial strife, it's harder and harder to finance a, a CPV project. So technologically speaking, it's a cool technology and it has potential, uh, specifically because you have greater um, cost reductions through economies of scale that have yet to be achieved in CPV uh, and leveraging things like the guys at Solar Junction. I mean, if you get to 50% efi efficiency, that is a huge boon for the CPV guys. Um, and even so, you could build a CPV system now with shells that are as efficient as these guys, and let's say they improve their technology, you could then go back and retrofit the cell component rather than the entire system and continue to use all of the glass and the steel that you built in that is still valuable. So potential, but there's a lot of other things that have to fall into place before you see CPV really take off. And unfortunately, a lot of that has to do with more of the business side of things than the actual technology side of things. Sure. Um, so <laughs> I, I actually fell into this role. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, amazingly, didn't want it or couldn't take it because he, his wife was busy doing something and he had a couple of kids at home and so he just had his time filled with other things. But um, as the Innovation Scout, uh, it's my job and pleasure to run around and talk to as many people as I can and build up a, a network of stakeholders and sort of a diversity of sources to try and understand where the technology is trending, uh, both from a uh, efficiency and cost standpoint and what's happening in the market, such that I can inform the people that I speak with and the decision makers at the electric utilities what would be their best option going forward. Um, because if you talk to a utility business guy, they're not just focused on the technological attributes of a particular solution. They also want to know about the economical, or the, the economics behind it. And if you can say that the prices are going to continue to fall, then maybe they wait another six months or a year before they purchase a PV system. Or if you can say that uh, you may want to be cautious about purchasing from these guys because they may not be around in a year. And it's not so much that the technology is bad, but if you're a utility, you want your investment to be covered by the warranty. And the warranty is not valid if the company's not around. And so as the scout, I track technology, price, uh, efficiency, market, trends, um, business models, anything to do with photovoltaics so that I can get the best gist of where the market is going and how you can take advantage of that and where you need to position yourself to avoid um, being taken advantage of because of those positions. So I just get to talk to people like yourselves. <laughs> so Adam, I was wondering if I could put you on the spot because of that same audience yeah. and um, if there's potential for our students to engage with every in yeah. If that's welcome or possible or so, so the short answer is yes. The long answer is uh, we'd have to get creative and figure out how to either bring folks over here or bring research to you guys. Um, I, I got a lot of questions today about the inverter side of things, which is quite interesting because I recall this being more of a, a cell design and module focused school. Um, but that's quite cool because it's, a, it's probably one of the biggest issues going forward for electric utilities that are going to have to be dealing with higher and higher penetration rates of PV and maybe not under their control. 
because if it goes up on a rooftop that is somebody's house or somebody's business, that is different from a utility scale system that they get to tweak all the knobs and everything like that. So understanding all of the integration aspects um, is a big deal. And if that's stuff of interest, then I'm sure that there would be a way to, to score an internship or something along those lines. And if there's more of a, a more in-depth research desire, then that's also something we can talk about. So that's a short answer and a long answer. So if there are students interested, should they contact you? Or? Yeah, uh, you, I'll be happy to provide my email address. Um, these guys know how to get in touch with me. Um, and I'll be happy to continue talking. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I might um, stop, finish there. So thank you once again for coming. And I'd like to thank you for yeah, all your contributions. Thank you. Thank you very much.